Okay. Well, I, sh I see two o'clock on my, uh, on my clock here. So, uh, we have a full agenda. So why don't we get, uh, why don't we get moving? So I want to, uh, say hello to everyone, a very warm uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's our pleasure to be sharing the highlights of our three year strategic plan, including a, a detailed overview of a new strategic initiative that is launching this spring. My name is Jeffrey Mote. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada, and I am joined by our Scientific Officer, Dr. Jose Pereira, and our Vice President of Operations, John Faulkner. In terms of housekeeping, um, your microphones have been muted, uh, but it doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. So while we do have a agenda, we would encourage your, your feedback, your commentary uh, throughout the presentation by leveraging the Q&A function that can be found at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to share your questions or comments at any point during the presentation and we'll respond accordingly. Time permitting, we'll share some of these comments and questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get around to answering your question during the presentation, we'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. Next slide, please. Okay, so for, um, for the strategic plan portion of today's session, we're gonna be taking you through a brief, a brief background on Pallium's beginnings followed by an overview of our vision and mission that together provide a statement of the organization's purposes, goals, and values. Uh, this will be followed by an overview of our guiding principles that represent the values that guide how we do our work and engage with each other and our partners. We'll share our key success factors that are important elements uh, that are required for Pallium to achieve uh, its objectives and fulfill its mission. And lastly, we'll take you through uh, our three-year objectives and priorities. Next slide, please. Before we get into the details of our plan, I'd like to share a few observations. Uh, there's, there's been no other time in recent history where palliative care has mattered more. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the strengths and weaknesses in our healthcare systems, including the provision of and, and access to palliative care for all Canadians. For over 20 years, this organization has had the privilege of helping to build palliative care capacity in thousands of communities right across this country and in service to tens of thousands of healthcare professionals working in different settings and in different areas of care. This three-year strategic plan builds on this track records of success and represents really an exciting new path forward. Um, as our organization has evolved to meet the growing needs of those we serve, uh, so has our approach to knowledge transfer. Uh, while our focus on supporting healthcare professionals, healthcare organizations, communities remains unchanged, our approach to spread and scale uh, of the palliative care approach is moving in an exciting new direction. For starters, we're firm believers in the concept of lifelong learning and supporting learners from the time that they're in school and throughout their professional career. And to provide this kind of support, it does require us to move beyond a single course transaction and to become a trusted education partner that walks alongside healthcare providers and ensures that they're equipped with the knowledge and the information that they require to perform at their best and ensure patients and families receive earlier and more effective palliative care. The content that we develop and curate has to continually meet the ever-changing needs of our learners and the health systems in which they practice. It has to be learner-centric, uh, it has to align with provincial, territorial, or national competencies. It needs to, to leverage new technologies, be flexible in how the content is delivered, and presented in multiple ways to increase accessibility and ultimately drive uptake. This vision compels us to think beyond the boundaries of a typical classroom or an online course. Uh, we'll continue to embrace new approaches like targeted course adaptations, just-in-time learning, and micro-credentialing, uh, to name a few. And in addition to developing evidence-informed accredited content that has really been at the core of Pallium's value proposition, um, our work will extend to better support learners to implement into practice the knowledge that they've acquired and embrace a quality improvement approach as part of their work. Our thought leadership will continue through a bold research agenda that in part will, will measure and demonstrate the impact of our work at a systems level. And Jose will be talking about that a little later. And this plan provides a roadmap to where we ultimately want to be, uh, which is a place where all health systems, organizations, and communities support a palliative care approach by ensuring 
all care providers acquire the skills and knowledge so that patients and families receive the best possible care. If we can accomplish this, we believe that it has the potential to serve as a model of excellence for other parts of healthcare. So I guess I'm humbly asking all of you to join us as partners in making this vision a reality and help us extend this mandate and service to, to more professionals, to more organizations and more communities, because we all believe that palliative care, of course, is everyone's business. Um, I believe that in order to strike a new bold path forward, uh, one has to know uh, and learn from where one's been. And so I'll now hand the floor over to Jose, who will enlighten us on Pallium's humble beginnings. Jose. Thank you very much. So uh, th this is the story uh, where Pallium started and the story, or more specifically, the patient that has inspired Pallium through all the years. And, and the story, I think, is still holds very true and is still uh, an important beacon for us um, as we do our work. And looking back over 20 years now, uh, when we started uh, Pallium, I can honestly say that we have kept with this mission and the vision. And now, as uh, Jeff said, it's even more important uh, than ever before. So I was in the early 1990s, was working as a family physician in a small rural town in Manitoba. I had never received any training in palliative care. In fact, I did not even uh, know the word, to be quite honest. And one day a patient came to see me. Um, his name is George, and I use that because I've received permission uh, from the family to use the name. Um, George was a man who was in his mid-50s and had been diagnosed with metastatic colorectal cancer. And unfortunately, the disease had progressed despite the treatments. And so he came to me after having gone to two or three other doctors um, in his region uh, without any success in terms of addressing his needs. And I remember him very clearly sitting down with his wife and he said, look, I know I'll be dying in the next few months, but I'm experiencing severe pain and other symptoms. And I cannot live like this. Um, I cannot suffer like this in whatever time I have left and I'm looking for help. And I vividly remember not knowing what to do. Um, I remember very clearly thinking to myself, my goodness, I've never been trained on this. I don't know what I'm gonna say. And I ended up telling him that the little small little dose of morphine, which today I know was, was uh, woefully inadequate. Um, I ended up telling him that that little uh, small dose of morphine, I couldn't increase because he had become addicted. Um, and, and I wasn't able to provide with him with any other advice. Um, George looked at me, looked at his wife. I, I still remember them standing up getting to the door. And then he turned around and he said, I hope one day people like you, meaning us as healthcare professionals, as a healthcare system, can help people like me. And um, his wife started crying and they walked out. Um, I then I felt very uh, useless and helpless at that time and embarrassed for my profession, embarrassed uh, for th the healthcare that I wasn't providing or able to provide. And I went to the coffee room, shared the story with a nurse uh, a very good friend of mine. And uh, the next day on my desk was this um, pamphlet for a pad of care course that was at McMaster where I'm now working in. And so I flew there. I couldn't find any other course. There was no training anywhere around uh, where I was. Um, struggled to get into the program, did it. And what I learned was that with a little bit of education, we can make such a big difference. Cause I flew back and asked George for a second chance, which he did. And, um, uh, and it made all the difference in the last three months of his life. So that's been the inspiration of Pallium, was how can we help people like George? How can we reach out and educate all the healthcare professionals with these basic core competencies that make all the difference in people's lives at a very difficult time of their lives? Next, please. I know some of you have heard that story before, and if you have, I apologize, but I know there are many others who haven't heard it. And so that is our ins inspiration. George is with us. And actually, I, w I got to meet his wife many years later in Regina when I was teaching there, of course, and she was ecstatic to hear that um, George had inspired change across the country and continued to be inspiring change across the country. So with that, then, our vision is to improve palliative care um, for uh, right across the country, and that palliative care is everyone's business. Everyone has a role to provide palliative care. I, in that small town, the nurse that worked with me and our team in a small town, when I moved to a larger city, being able to do that as well. 
And the mission is that we equip all healthcare professionals and communities because because it's everyone's business, it's not just about healthcare professionals, it's also community as well, with the knowledge and tools to provide palliative care uh, for every Canadian who needs it. Thanks, Jose. We'll uh, turn the floor now over to John. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff and Jose. And before we get into the, the details of our, of our strategic plan, we really just want to talk a little bit about some of the enabling um, uh, uh, components that, that will help us deliver on that strategic plan. So uh, in terms of guiding principles, um, you have them listed here. I won't read them all verbatim, uh, but really these, these uh, articulate the values uh, that we as an organization are committed to and the behaviors that we as an organization, both leadership and staff, uh, are committed to following. And so believe very strongly, as Jose was talking about, about being that catalyst for change, uh, helping to improve uh, access and availability of palliative care across the country, uh, and recognizing that we don't do that alone. We do that with partners, with collaborators, with facilitators, uh, thousands of individuals and hundreds of organizations across this country that we work collaboratively with um, towards that mission. Uh, we also uh, recognize uh, the importance of being flexible and responsive. And we've learned that this year more than any other about the, the need to adapt, uh, the need to rise to challenges and take advantages of opportunities and we're very much committed to, to continuing to do that, uh, along with uh, being accountable and transparent in the work that we do. Um, we also acknowledge the importance of, of the culture, uh, both within our organization and the way that the organization conducts itself uh, as, a, as a key enabling function to help us be, be successful, uh, as well as a commitment to, to ongoing excellence. And this is about both achieving that excellence and driving uh, in everything that we do to exceed our own and our partners and stakeholders expectations, but also recognizing and celebrating that excellence. And that's something that we haven't always done as much as we probably should. Um, so recognizing excellence when it occurs and not just our excellence, uh, where we think we've been successful, but the excellence of others and things that are happening in the field, um, trying to be, as we talked to earlier, together in service, recognizing that collaboration. Next slide, please. And, and so this really leads into some of the key success factors that we see as essential in underpinning uh, the implementation and growth of this strategic plan. Uh, starting with strong board governance, uh, we've been blessed to have very engaged and active board members uh, over the duration of this organization and that continues to this day. Uh, and you'll see in our strategic plan some of the elements that we're going to be doing to strengthen that board governance. Uh, strong financial stewardship, which has been uh, essential to us as an organization uh, and continues to be as a, as a nonprofit social enterprise. Um, I spoke earlier about the, uh, the partners that we work with, our facilitators and our stakeholders, uh, and we will continue to uh, do everything we can to strengthen our, our efforts on that front, to be better partners and uh, to better support our facilitators and our, and our stakeholders where we can. Uh, healthy workplace culture, as we spoke about, uh, this has been absolutely critical to us. We've been blown away this year by the work of our team in responding during during a crisis, it's been disruptive, as we know, um, globally, it's been disruptive to palliative manner, and we've been just blown away with the, the response we've seen from our staff. We know that comes from, from a strong culture, and, and that's something we need to maintain if we're going to be successful. Um, and then finally, a, a strong client focus, and Jeff spoke about this in his opening remarks, but really making sure that what we're doing is meeting the needs of the people that we're serving, and that's going to be a key focus for us. Thanks, John. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so if we're to summarize our way forward over the next uh, three years, Pallium's knowledge transfer strategy will evolve to support continuous targeted learning that meets the needs of our learners, um, the content and methodology for which will be informed by research and, uh, and empowered by technology, all of which serves to spread and scale the palliative care approach and is, is recognized as a model for building healthcare and community capacity in Canada and abroad. So that, that really sums up um, everything just up to this point that we've described to you in terms of our, our way forward. Next slide, please. So let's start to tuck into the nitty gritty of our plan. Um, with respect to our objectives, we've outlined four key objectives uh, that are part of this plan. The first one is around achieving financial sustainability. And this objective is about 
achieving financial and mission related results to ensure that that we meet the needs of, of our beneficiaries in the long term, uh, but we do so in a manner that's sustainable. Secondly, uh, is building healthcare and community capacity. And this is about making the most out of the finite resources that exist in our health system uh, and in our communities by ultimately empowering more people to provide better palliative care, which will extend capabilities across health and social care systems to ultimately better serve patients and families and their caregivers. Thirdly, advancing research and thought leadership in palliative care. This objective focuses uh, on leveraging our networks, uh, our, our talents, our passion, our expertise, and to share insights and best practices and innovations that, that really serve to challenge the status quo and, and influence, inspire, and advance the palliative care approach. And then lastly, uh, delivering operational excellence. This is about embracing best practices and tools to create um, sustainable improvement within the organization, including, as John mentioned just a few moments ago, creating an organizational culture that will allow Pallium to deliver valuable products and services for, for those it serves to ultimately achieve long-term sustainable growth. So we'd like to now take you through uh, the priorities under each of these four objectives, and I'll kick things off. Uh, on the next slide, which what well, the slide, which is um, uh, financial sustainability. So first off, um, it's it's very important that we continue to embrace the principles of a social enterprise. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this concept, a social enterprise is a revenue generating organization that has two goals. First and foremost um, is to achieve its mission. And second is to earn revenue. Uh, any revenue surpluses are reinvested into the operation in service of its mission rather than fulfilling obligations to uh, shareholders or owners. So mission is at the center of Pallium's work with income generation playing an important supporting role. And we believe to be financially sustainable, Pallium has to continue building resiliency into its business model. And this is, this, is the, this is basically the ability to, to bend without breaking and, and adapt regardless of what we encounter, much like we've all experienced during COVID. And we see three distinct priorities under this objective. The first one is financial resilience, no surprise. Um, you know, we have to continue embracing um, the fundamentals such as uh, revenue diversification to become far less reliant on a single large source of revenue. Uh, cost and risk management, um, and building and managing any financial reserves that we may have. The second priority is around product and market share resilience. Um, we have 18 LEAP products, and that suite of products is growing. So uh, how do we make sure that we are tapping in to all the different settings of care that could benefit uh, from these different LEAP products? That means that we have to have a better understanding of our clients and the markets that we want to be in. We have to continue cultivating strong relationships, getting those feedback loops to refine the content we put out there and, and tapping into multiple um, you know, reliable data points to, to inform any product or market decisions that we take. So this is an important one. I think we're, we're gonna see a lot more activity on this front uh, because we know that uh, we have a lot of great products out there, um, but the uptake uh, has been sluggish with some of them. And that's just been from, from a lack of, of, of marketing effort that we're now putting more resources into. So we're pretty excited about, uh, about 1.2. Priority 1.3 arguably is a derivative of priority 1.1, 1 .1, uh, but we called this out given the increasingly prominent role our funding partners are playing in supporting our work and contributing to our sustainability. Um, there is a, a third leg to this stool, if you will. It's not on the slide, but it's gonna be covered off by John. In, in just a moment, and that's around team resiliency. And this is the, the need to invest in, in recruitment, uh, communicating clear objectives and expectations, uh, performance measurement, uh, empowerment, as John mentioned earlier, recognition. Um, so those are the three distinct priorities we see under this particular objective, and I'll, I'll now pass the floor over to John, who's gonna speak about our second objective. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and so, uh, the second uh, objective really speaks to this building healthcare and, and community capacity. It's very much at the heart of delivering on our mission, as you well know, um, and includes, of course, uh, LEAP and all of the, the derivatives of LEAP that Jeff just spoke about. 
Um, but really it goes beyond that. And this is about our commitment to continue to evolve and grow and develop the way and innovate in the, the ways in which we, we build this, this community and this healthcare capacity. And as Jeff spoke about in his opening statements, become that learning partner across the learning journey for so many uh, versus this sort of transactional relationship that we've too often had in our past. And so that's really collectively what these uh, five priorities under Strategic Objective 2 are speaking about. So 2.1 is really talking about what do we do with LEAP to then accelerate and further grow the, the integration of palliative care into the healthcare system. And you're going to hear about uh, Project ECHO as a, as a key a cornerstone piece of that uh, later today but other ways that we can do that. And, and uh, doing that in 2.2, working with our partners and stakeholders. And so again, where there's a great program out there that exists, how can we help support to grow and scale that excellent program, put it on a national level where we know it can deliver value towards, towards our mission and the mission and objectives of our, our partners and stakeholders, all with this idea of reducing duplication and, and uh, reducing effort that, that happens in developing programs like this. We see it too often and, and we've seen it too often in our sector for sure. Um, 2.3 really speaks to uh, this learning journey. And so how do we make sure that the products that we are developing are meeting identified needs, needs that are uh, learner or customer or client driven, that are system driven and that are patient driven. And so we're building out resources and tools that people need across their, as we talk about this learning journey, as they're you know, filling out the, the competencies and capacities that they need um, to do their work effectively and support patients. We also have learned a heck of a lot over the past year uh, in terms of product innovation. And so uh, the move to leap online delivery models has been more successful, I think, than we might have hoped. Uh, it has done things that we didn't expect it to do. So it's opened uh, new, uh, new ways of learning. It's helped us reach new customers that before were unable to be, or new learners that we were unable to access before. And uh, we've also brought in new ways of providing content, such as, such as webinars. We have another one just today, which sold out, I think, in about 48 hours. So those types of things are going to continue. Uh, and we're excited to see the return of face-to-face -face learning uh, in parallel with that. So the question then becomes, what do we do to continue to grow that innovation and bring new ways of learning or new products to the market where it's, where it's meeting a need? And then finally, ensuring that we're doing that, not just for the healthcare system, but also for the community and making sure that when we do this for the community, we're also uh, working with our partners to measure the impact that that, that work is having within the community to build that capacity. Excellent. Thank you, John. Jose, over to you. Thanks, John. So uh, strategic objective number three relates to advancing research and thought leadership in part of care. And in this one, there are a few components to this and several activities under those two components. And um, we think of these components as being evaluation and research. And within those, there are various activities and there's obviously lots of overlap. Um, in terms of knowledge, we are a knowledge translation um, uh, organization. That's what we do. We identify the best practices, the best evidence from across the country, bring it together from the across the country and get it to the front lines of care as quickly as possible. In the case of our Compassionate Communities Program, we're also looking for how can we support it? How can we uh, push it uh, further? Um, and how can we get more communities involved and doing that amazing work? So in terms of the evaluation, over the years, we have and we continue to always evaluate the products. So, for example, our LEAP courses, learners are continually providing feedback, what's working, what's not working. And so are the over 900 facilitators across the country. Uh, we often receive input from them and we use that to drive quality improvement um, on an ongoing basis and quality assurance as well. Over the years, we've used different frameworks to evaluate um, the program. Um, in the, in the first phases, so in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, we used models like Kirkpatrick's model that looks at uh, evaluating the impact of an education program. Um, at the time, we used Health Canada's uh, um, model evaluation uh, framework. Um, and now we're sitting down again with a whole group of experts from across the country and internationally and asking them, 
how do we now uh, in to, you know in 2021 and going forward for the next five to ten years what should we be doing to do evaluation so we're in the process of going through literally hundreds of evaluation frameworks to identify the ones that are most applicable to Pallium and its LEAP courses, its compassionate communities. The, um, in fact, the compassionate communities, um, we've been working with, with colleagues from across the country really that have identified a fantastic framework that we will be adapting uh, components of it. So within the next few months, working with, uh, as I said, with this community, we're going to have a framework that we can then apply to evaluating uh, the program. And importantly, it goes beyond just what we refer to as attribution evaluation. In other words, we don't want to just know how does the learner's knowledge change? Um, how are they implementing in practice? Um, and what impact, obviously, very importantly, is it having on patients and the healthcare system? But we're also asking the question about contribution. In other words, what are the factors that help scale up and spread these interventions? And what are the barriers? So we can learn, uh, learn that. Um, research, obviously, is a very strong driver. We have for example, for many years, promoted um, interprofessional learning. And we hear that that's, you know, you can, we can see that in this modern day with the uh, healthcare needs of a growing and aging population, chronic diseases, comorbidities, uh, interprofessional uh, collaboration is key. And we've been supporting that for all these years. So there's opportunities for further research on top of what we've already been doing and have recently submitted for publication, for example, learning on how we can bring different professions together to learn together in order to work together. Um, we have some fantastic uh, research collaborations. So Pallium has a research partnership with McMaster University. It's called the Joshua Shad uh, Research Hub. It's with, uh, the development started uh, while Dr. Joshua Shad, who was my predecessor actually at, at, uh, at McMaster University, um, had reached out to Pallium to say, look, there's fantastic opportunities for research around education, palliative care education, spreading the palliative care approach. Can we collaborate? Um, uh, very sadly, he died very suddenly and unexpectedly, but, but he had put that already in motion. And we've got that hub now and uh, beginning to do some really interesting work and reaching out to colleagues across the country. Uh, for example, with Ontario Tech, uh, we're doing some, some collaboration there, some research there. And we look forward to many more collaborations with other colleagues and teams across the country. So the priorities is to ensure research and strategic initiatives remain a source of influence as they've always been, but become even more so. Um, that we learn more about uh, research to advance education um, and make it even more effective. And John has spoken about some of those elements. Uh, look for those uh, uh, facilitators of innovation, spread and scale, and then address uh, barriers and strategies to address barriers. Um, and obviously influencing uh, policy through what we learn. For example, with the work being done with the paramedics and the use of the lead paramedics across the country and the impact that's having and learning from that so that we can help uh, that data spread and scale the approach. Thanks, Jose. Uh, John, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. And, and finally, um, delivering operational excellence. And this is a little bit of you know, inside baseball in terms of the how we do what we do. Uh, but it's critically important to underpinning the, the success of, of the organization and the success of the strategic plan going forward. And so we've spoken uh, several times now about building this strong organizational culture, uh, making sure that we've got effective communications within our staff, training development to meet the, the needs of the organization and support our staff in, in growing. Um, we've seen the returns on that investment, I will say again, in spades um, as our staff continually just figure stuff out and learn new ways of, of, of uh, delivering education and responding to, to the needs of the community and needs of uh, our stakeholders. Um, you know, we don't have webinar experts. We, we build that internally and, and that uh, speaks volume to the culture that we do have and the work that we need to do to continue to support and strengthen that, that organizational culture. Um, Similarly, we, we know there are opportunities for us to streamline some of our core processes um, and to make sure that we're measuring performance effectively. Uh, Jose spoke about the importance of data and research as an enabling function, and that extends not just to the, the courses that we develop and the educational work that we do, but also the organization itself and making sure that we've got key performance indicators and that data is driving the decisions that we make 
in terms of products that we launch and effectiveness of the, the work that we're doing. Um, we, we know we need to continue to evolve and adapt our IT ecosystem. Uh, it's been a huge enabler for us. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort growing and developing it, and it's going to continue to grow and evolve and develop as we look at new innovative ways of bringing, um, bringing education and, and making resources available to people across the country and figuring out how we can use that um, ecosystem to support others in the work that they're doing as well. It's an asset that, that, uh, that we have and that we're happy to share when and where it makes sense. Um, the last two really speak to uh, good governance for the organization. Uh, this has been a, a big focus, um, again, building on an area of strength for us, but a big focus to, to tighten up our board governance, uh, make sure that we are following best practices and continuing to strengthen that uh, over the coming three years, as well as uh, specifically striking an adv uh, ambassador advisory council uh, with, with the focus really to help support the board, uh, fill specific gaps uh, in, in uh, skills and abilities and supplement uh, the board's work towards, uh, towards the organization and its mission. Excellent. Thanks, John. So that wraps up the first part of our presentation. And uh, I'll just say here that if you know anyone who may find what we've presented today to be useful, please let them know that we have two additional sessions planned, as you see here, an encore performance of this presentation on March 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard, and a French presentation on March 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can get a copy of our three-year strategic plan on our website, and you can see the address there on your screen. And I would like to take a moment to thank our valuable funding partners who support several aspects of our mandate. We would now like to move on and share with you a new strategic initiative that we're very excited about, and that represents a, a tangible example of how this really supports our, our new direction forward. So this uh, initiative is called the Palliative Care ECHO Project, uh, which we have the privilege of leading alongside several key partners to help build primary palliative care capacity. Project ECHO stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. Uh, and it was developed in 2003 in the US at the University of New Mexico. Uh, and it's a hub and spoke model designed to connect primary care providers to specialists to provide just-in-time consultation support and learning uh, for the care of patients and conditions for which there were no local specialists to refer to. Um, the Palliative Care Co Project is a capacity building telementoring program designed to create um, virtual communities of learners by bringing together local healthcare providers and community leaders uh, with regional, provincial, territorial, and national subject matter experts for training, for um, deep dive learning, uh, for brief lecture presentations, uh, and quality improvement discussions, uh, really fostering this notion of all learn, all teach. That's the approach that the ECHO model takes. Next slide, please. So the Palliative Care ECHO Project is a five-year initiative uh, funded by Health Canada that will harness this ECHO approach uh, and technology to, to really help accelerate the spread of the palliative care approach right across the country and more importantly, build palliative care capacity. Uh, so leveraging this hub and spoke education model, and John's gonna describe this in just a moment in more detail. And through the leadership of the hub partners that we bring on board, this project will help healthcare providers uh, build local capacity by equipping them with the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence, along with, with updated tools and resources to ultimately help them provide earlier, more effective and more compassionate, high quality palliative care to patients and their families and their caregivers. The content that is shared through this hub and spoke model will integrate with existing local palliative care education programs uh, or capacity building activities and resources. It, it'll ultimately serve to strengthen and complement these activities that are already underway. It's not meant to replace them, but to complement them. Um, the training and development priorities uh, that are established are, are done so collaboratively with each of our hub partners. So Pallium's role is to source or create content to meet hub needs and are delivered through what is called an echo session, which is simply Zoom video conferencing, to be quite frank. Um, the great news is, is that all echo sessions are free of charge. 
and each echo session is evaluated to ultimately improve future sessions and it, it'll also help to identify any new training or development opportunities. So with this concept in mind, I'm going to pass the floor back to John, who will speak in more detail about our hub and spoke model. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. And, and this really is the sort of secret sauce, if you will, behind, behind the ECHO model, certainly one of the key factors of success for it. And so the diagram you see here is a, is a simplified graphical representation of the interaction between Pallium as a super hub and the different hub partners, which we're you know, in the early stages of actively uh, recruiting and engaging with now. And the, the, the way it works is, as Jeff described a little bit, the, the hubs identify specific partners based on the communities um, or the audience, if you will, that they are, are servicing and the priorities or learning priorities that exist within those hubs and their, their uh, representative spokes that, that link in with them. And, Pallium works with those hub partners and with the other hub partners to identify and share resources that can deliver on, uh, on those uh, learning priorities or learning needs. And this is this concept of, of forced multiplication of learning where the hub two is learning something valuable and then sharing that with the other hubs and the other hubs are building on that and sharing that back. And Pallium is the, the, the grease at the middle, if you will, that's helping to, to make all of this work and doing that curation and, and project management work to help support all of these pieces, as well as the data and the evaluation work to, to make sure that what we're doing is effective, that we're delivering on what we said we would deliver on and that we're meeting the needs that have been identified. So next slide, please. It, it's important to realize too, that uh, this is not a one size fits all model. Uh, we expect every hub to be different in the way that it works. Um, but a simplified version here, you see with the hub and at the center of that, we, we have a hub coordinator role, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but a, a key function is not just the hub coordinator. There, there will be a team of, of people we expect in most of these hubs working with the hub coordinator, but uh, basically that hub team, uh, then collaborating with local spokes. And these spokes may be, uh, a local family health clinic, they may be a hospice, they may be a long-term care facility, but these are the places that employ the people that provide care to patients and their families. And so all of those spoke groups are coming together and receiving the education that is then delivered and coordinated by the hub itself um, and Pallium supporting that. And we envision a world where these hubs um, have some existing programming. Many of these organizations that are um, engaged in, in becoming a hub are already doing something in terms of education around palliative care, et cetera. And the opportunity there is for them to then take, hey, I've got this new program that's available to me through ECHO. How do I bring that in because it meets a specific need or something I was struggling to, to meet before? I don't have to create it again. It's proven to work and, and I've got some support to help make it happen as well as being able to then access national ECHO programming. And so Pallium as a, as a super hub um, will also be delivering uh, certain types of education on a national basis. And so there's some examples there around a journal club, around a QI series, or around you know, the, the national webinars that we've been running, we see continuing as part of, a part of Project ECHO around national best practices and sharing information. So the, all those resources together are then available to be delivered by the hub uh, to the spoke partners and also be able to be shared then across other hubs to be delivered to other spokes and so on and so forth. And that's where that multiplication comes together. Next slide, please. And, and this is where the model has been proven to work. Um, almost 400 hubs and super hubs uh, functioning across the, the world as part of Project ECHO on all types of topics, not just palliative care, but all types of, of healthcare topics and issues. Um, and uh, we're dealing with hubs uh, in 40 countries and participants in over 144 countries. So um, really strong uptake in response to the Echo Hub and Super Hub model. And we're very, very excited to be becoming a Super Hub here in Canada soon on palliative care. Indeed. Over to Jose. After all these months, I still forget. <laughs> um, so we've heard some examples from John about what a hub uh, can start looking like or what the system can start looking like. 
So what I'd like to focus on this slide is uh, what activity will be happening within the hubs. And so as we, as Jeff and John were saying, it, it can vary and it really depends on the hubs activity. So the hubs can be different things for different groups, different uh, uh, people um, and can look in, as I said, uh, look at things in, in different ways. So for example, it could be uh, informed by a geography. So it could be a hub reaching out to rural physicians, rural nurses, rural healthcare professionals, and even remote. Uh, Pallium has got a long history of reaching out to rural and remote um, healthcare professionals. Um, it could be in a specific setting of care. So for example, healthcare professionals um, and other care providers working in long-term care. Um, it could also reach out by profession um, or specialty area. So personal support workers, for example, or hubs of say, cardiology or nephrology, uh, spreading the know-how of how to integrate palliative care in their various um, um, uh, specialty areas. Um, and then obviously very important, the populations served. And the example here are the indigenous populations. Um, there can be hubs to support a part of care in, in those areas um, as well. Um, the second important thing is that these hubs are usually led by an organization. So there's leadership. Um, and the examples we provided here are very good examples of vibrant uh, hubs uh, that already exist in Canada. Uh, CAMH, for example, of Toronto, that focus on mental health, addiction medicine, um, is, is a hub that's been very successful and been led by the CAMH crew. There is the chronic pain and opioid management uh, hub um, led out of the University Health Network in Toronto, and then a pediatric uh, pad of care hub and pediatric pain hub um, led by sick kids. So a lot of opportunities for a lot of organizations to participate um, and to partner with us as hubs. Next, please. So here are some examples of what an echo session can look like. In the first one, uh, it could be uh, interprofessional team of palliative care experts that come together with monthly sessions. Um, and the echo is the platform by which we uh, offer those sessions uh, using Zoom uh, video conferencing technology. What they usually look like is a short didactic overview, much like we do our theory bursts. We've called them, we've been doing that for many years since 2000. Um, and then uh, followed by a case-based, uh, patient-based or problem-based um, discussion where you actually use a real world case uh, to address learning points and to learn together, to share. It is a very um, knowledge constructing um, exercise and activity. Um, and then that follows with more uh, in-depth discussions. So that from that, we hope that we can disseminate a lot of, as we've been doing with the webinar, uh, uh, with the webinars during the COVID, the COVID webinars is uh, capturing a lot of tacit knowledge and experience that's emerging, that's new, that we can then capture, codify and help spread. The second example is monthly lunch and learn webinars, for example, with personal support workers who can come together and share experiences, share insights from the various organizations and even across the country. So a fantastic way to, to uh, spread new ideas and innovation and, and learnings. And also, it's also about sharing where things have failed or not worked, because we always think of them as failures, rather they've been learning opportunities and we can share those learning opportunities. Um, and that's an example of how we are adapting more and more a quality improvement mindset so that we can be quality improvement um, uh, facilitators in the healthcare system. Um, and on that point, another example of the sessions we'll be doing would be quality improvement sessions. And we've just recently collaborated with the McMaster um, uh, part of Kate, the Joshua uh, Shad McMaster Hub, where we hosted a whole Innovations Day uh, together with McMaster. Um, we hosted a whole uh, afternoon actually on innovations and learned some fantastic innovations across the country. So imagine that would be a regular thing where we can showcase examples of uh, lessons learned through quality improvement exercises across uh, the country. Thank you. You, John. Great. Thanks, Jeff. 
Uh, and so we want to talk a little bit about the, the role of the hub coordinator. And I'll, I'll stress at the start that this is really an example um, of what the role will look like. Uh, it really is up to the individual hub in terms of what their needs are and, and um, the, the function and the role and how that will support the work of the hub. Uh, but we envision this primarily as a, as a part-time uh, in a lot of organizations that we've been discussing uh, this with, there will be other responsibilities that will fall on this person's plate in terms of whether it's education focused or coordination within a network, et cetera. Uh, but really the, the key function from a Project ECHO perspective is promoting and supporting the implementation of the Palliative Care ECHO project within their hub and among the local spoke partners. Um, they'll also be uh, responsible for uh, creating a lot of that connectivity back with the super hub and uh, between other hubs. And that's something that, that uh, Pali will be supporting directly through our project manager. Um, this could be a new position within the hub. It could be an existing role. It could be something that's added on to that role, um, uh, et cetera. That really, again, is up to, up to the individual hub. Uh, and happy to say that uh, through our, our support for this project, um, we're able to provide a little bit of funding to help offset some of the costs uh, for the, the individual that will be taking on this work as part of the, the coordinator responsibilities. Okay. okay, thanks, John. So as you've probably gathered up to this point, um, Pallium's role in all of this is, is akin to a, an orchestra leader. Um, in addition to being the lead for this initiative, we work very closely with our hub partners. We conduct uh, needs analysis with each of them. Uh, we hold regular status meetings to ensure they're, they're on track with project deliverables. Uh, we play a coaching role. Uh, we also connect them with other hub partners, as John mentioned earlier, to support the knowledge exchange. Um, but we'll also be curating content. And in some cases, we'll create new content. We'll lead all the national ECHO sessions uh, we also support the overall project from an IT perspective, uh, and we also lead the evaluation on the impact of ECHO, which uh, actually Jose would be speaking to us about uh, right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I mentioned in the first part of the of the session today, uh, uh, the evaluation framework uh, plan and research plan that we're developing um, and there's a connection with this as well because we want to make sure that we have the right framework to really understand the program both from as I said from a um, con an attribution perspective what is the impact but also in a contribution um, what helps us scale up and uh, etc so on a micro level every echo session will be evaluated um, so that we can support the um, ongoing uh, um, evaluation of, of the sessions and the whole program. Um, and then there's also on a more macro level, working with partners, um, so the different hubs, evaluating the impact um, and also the spread and scale actually of those various hubs. And so all hub partners will be uh, given access to performance data. Um, our IT ecosystem now and infrastructure allows us to uh, put together reports very, very rapidly. Um, and that includes dashboards uh, to tell us how how we're doing, how's it spreading. Um, for example, with the COVID webinars, we've been able to track um, how many people registered, how many have uh, participated with our online courses. Uh, we know how many people signed on, how many of the modules they did. Um, all that helps us drive um, further development um, and more scale and spread uh, strategies. So obviously overall, we want to see how the palliative care ECHO program is doing um, from these different perspectives and hoping to collaborate with colleagues from across the country to do that evaluations. Great, thanks Jose. Okay, so uh, when we look at the overall uh, desired outcomes from this uh, national initiative, we believe that together we can achieve the following. Um, first off, we believe that, um, you know, a larger base of healthcare providers, and we're talking across different settings of care and geographies, and as we said here, professions, uh, who ultimately will integrate the palliative care approach into their practice and provide more timely care. Um, secondly, we also believe there's gonna be a larger network of healthcare providers who engage in, in knowledge development and sharing, right? And, and spreading 
tools and resources uh, related to provide the palliative care approach to their patients. Uh, that net knowledge exchange is critically important. So we really do hope to see not just a, a larger base of healthcare providers, you know, practicing better, more timely care, but but are engaging in that knowledge exchange, right? It's that um, it's that whole notion behind, um, you know, what ECHO is all about. Uh, providing more opportunities for healthcare professionals to access uh, specialist level palliative care, um, whether that's through virtual learning or you know, just-in-time clinic supports, as we say here, or uh, or wherever is needed. Um, th this this is ultimately um, a really big plus uh, for Echo. So, um, as you can appreciate, this is this is really actually not about leap programming. This is th th these are interventions that complement and go beyond uh, what we do with leap. So, um, being able to support, as we said very early on, that lifelong journey, lifelong learning journey. Um, Echo is, is the vehicle through which we can support that strategy. Um, another one, number four, is, is more specialist level palliative care teams um, equipped with the technology and the skills to, to allow them to impart their knowledge and provide more teaching opportunities to healthcare professionals in their region and beyond. Um, and ultimately, uh, as well, to provide uh, opportunities for more palliative care providers across the country uh, with QI skills um, and to support uh, undertaking QI in the workplace is something that we know is gaining greater prominence um, uh, over the recent past. So we're, we're happy to be supporting that strategy as well. So in terms of a wrap up, um, if we move to the next slide, please. So that pretty much wraps uh, our presentation up. And as I mentioned to you earlier, you can visit uh, Pallium's website at pallium.ca. Uh, if you click on the About tab and under the Strategic Plan header, you can download a copy of our three-year plan. If you're interested in being on our Palliative Care Echo project mailing list, please visit uh, one of these two uh, URLs, echopalliative.com. Uh, and I want to thank you again for taking time out of your schedule for joining us today. We really hope that this has uh, been informative. Uh, and I uh, want to take a pause. Uh, Robin, we'll open up the mic to you to see if there's any uh, questions or comments that we want to highlight. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, we did get one question um, just in terms of what Pallium's vision in terms of incorporation of these kinds of hubs for the ECHO project in the midst of Ontario Health, creating those Ontario Health teams. Yeah, well, we, we see the creation of, of hubs to be very complementary to these, these, these burgeoning OHTs, if you will. In fact, we've talked to many of them about themselves either becoming hubs or, uh, or banding together as many OHTs to be uh, part of a, a bigger hub, if you will. So I actually think it, it's meant to dovetail and complement the activity that's already underway within these OHTs. As we mentioned earlier, um, many of our hub partners or to be hub partners are already engaging in training and development. And we're not looking to duplicate any of that effort. Uh, but in working with these partners, it's what more can be done. There's always room for opportunities. There's always room for additional training and learning. And that's what we'd like to bring to the table at no cost to them. Um, and so if we uh, look at these OHTs, we think it actually can be a, a very for us and an opportunity to strike uh, more hub partnerships and, and add greater value to the healthcare professionals that they serve within their region. Thank you for that, uh, that question, Cindy. Um, any other ones that we've answered already that we want to highlight, Robin? Yeah, Jeff, there were a couple of questions about um, uh, programs and resources to support uh, communities and patients and caregivers uh, and volunteers as well. Uh, and so in the chat, I highlighted in response a couple of a uh, couple of key ones that we're working on that we're actually coming to very close to launch on. So one is uh, a care maps program. Mm. And this is an exciting program. It builds off work uh, from the Atlas of Caring out of the US, uh, where it really what you're doing is drawing a, you know, a hand-drawn sketch of the the support network around you as a caregiver when you're providing care or support for someone in need, someone at the end of life. Um, and uh, this is a, a program to help you to either A, develop and, and uh, build that yourself as an individual, 
uh, or B, we've actually designed a workshop program that compassionate communities across the country will be able to deliver either in person or online um, to, to support people in their community in developing their care maps. And then the third piece of that puzzle that we're building is uh, a short uh, module, learning module for healthcare professionals to understand more about these community care maps, how they work and how they can either use them or, you know, understand and support their their patients and families that they're working with uh, who may have developed their, their care map. So uh, we're excited about that and it, it uh, dovetails well with other work that we're doing around a faith community toolkit to better understand um, the palliative care and end of life process in, uh, in, in this case, uh, Catholic parishes um, and a uh, bunch of other new exciting stuff, including Elite Cares that we're working with uh, Champlain Lynn on adapting one of their courses for for caregiver focused uh, education. So lots happening in that space. And I think too, when we take all of that, John, and we marry that up with uh, the opportunities that ECHO presents uh, at a community level as well, I think this is, uh, I, I think uh, Diana and, and others who, uh, who have asked uh, uh, information about this, uh, you'll see more coming forward as a part, as part of the work we're doing with ECHO. So very exciting for uh, supporting communities. Good. Okay, so I don't see any more uh, open questions. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule. As I mentioned, a copy of the plan will be on our website. Uh, and I want to thank my colleagues, uh, John and Jose, for uh, uh, presenting alongside me and uh, bringing our plan and our new initiative to life. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, appreciate your participation. And we look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. All the best. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.